Hi, everybody. Today we're going to be speaking with John Shear. He was the first person at his company, which has raised $5 million in just its seed stage. John comes with experience from HubSpot, and he's going to be sharing with us today how to price a new product, how to make the transition from working in the business to working on it. He's also going to tell us how to find your target audience while selling a freemium product and how to use the support chat to better your sales team. And join us next week when we speak with Eric Nado, who runs a sales team of about 30, and he's going to be speaking to us about what he looks for when hiring an SDR and how to train the SDR so that they could be booking appointments within the first week. Now, let's let's jump into our conversation with John Shear. Startup Sales is a podcast about what it's really like to get a business off the ground. We talk with founders, CEOs, and sales VPs from the high-tech market. You'll learn how to build and scale a sales team. You'll also hear about the growth challenges and tough decisions from others who have had both successes and failures. And now, your host of the Startup Sales Podcast, Adam Springer. John, I'm very excited to have you uh, with us today and learn what you have to share. Thanks for joining us. Thank you for having me, Adam. I appreciate it. So why don't we start with, uh, if you could just give me your company pitch, your elevator pitch. Yeah, totally. So AppQs is an experience layer that sits on top of other software products that allows non-technical people to create user onboarding experiences, uh, walkthroughs that deliver a better product experience to your end user without having to use up any of your engineering resources. Excellent. And uh, it's who's your kind of target audience? Uh, our target audience is what we call consumer grade product teams. And that's uh, B2B software companies that leverage a free trial or B2C businesses. Uh, you know, Canva, who you mentioned, is a great example. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah, I would just use Canva myself uh, a couple months ago. Yeah, it's an awesome tool. Okay. And uh, what stage is the company in? We are, we're a seed stage business. We've raised $5 million in seed money from Accomplice and some local angels. Uh, we're at 40 employees and we're, we're going out to raise our Series A now. Wow, great. Wow, that sounds uh, really exciting. Uh, you were the first salesperson at the company, correct? Yes. Okay. So when you started there, um, how did you start? Where, how did you know what direction to take? So I was introduced to Jonathan Kim, who's the founder of AppQs um, from HubSpot. He's a former HubSpotter as well. And essentially, he had left HubSpot to pursue this idea of letting product marketers build in-app experiences without having to go through engineering. And Jonathan's a very scrappy dude. And he launched a, a landing page on Product Hunt with no real product behind the scenes. And he got, uh, he got hundreds of signups and he didn't really know what to do with those signups. And so one of his uh, former colleagues from HubSpot introduced him uh, to me. And basically we sat down one day and started calling all of his leads just to see, you know, just to show him how to do it a little. And at the same time, uh, you know, I was kind of looking for something, um, you know, the opportunity to get, get in real early at a company. So it was a, a good synergy. And, uh, you know, we basically realized that there was a market. And then, you know, we didn't have a product yet. And so when we started working together, there was a very light product. There were customers paying us. Uh, we hadn't yet raised any funding, but we were about to. And so my job, you know, for the first six months was really just to, to get on the phone with as many people as, as possible and sell them the vision of AppQs and, uh, and basically see where they would drop off in the sales funnel. What features, you know, did they need? before they were willing to purchase. And for us, it became pretty obvious pretty quickly what those gaps were in our future set today. And so my job was to essentially record every call that I had, um, take the notes and then give them to Jonathan, who was you know essentially doing product himself at the time. And then we brought on two more engineers. And so it wasn't really sales for, for a while. It was, uh, I believe the term is customer development, mm. which was a really fun stage and a good experience. <laughs> yeah. How, how many uh, how many people actually from the leads wanted to move forward and purchase? 
before I joined and I was just helping Jonathan one. And it was actually on the first day. Uh, we had this customer buy our biggest package, which was 450 bucks in MRR at the time. Uh, we really didn't expect anybody to buy it. Uh, but to me, that was very validating. They're like, whoa, like, we barely have a product here. Um, I certainly wouldn't <laughs> trust <laughs> trust myself to like let a, co- or, you know, a company use it. That was like really big and sophisticated. But you know, lo and behold, somebody bought it. They put their credit card in. Um, and, and that, you know, kind of said to me, Jonathan is, is onto something here and, you know, this is a good opportunity to, to jump in really early, uh, and, and get to be a part of, um, the whole process of building a business. Yeah, absolutely. It's like a blank canvas. hundred percent. Okay. So when you started and you really got going after the, uh, after figuring out what kind of market you had, uh, how did you set your first revenue goals? Um, interesting question. Okay, so we were we were about s- six months post fundraising um, at about ten customers, but nobody getting a ton of value out of our product. Um, when we decided to build this feature called called it Hotspots, and if, if you remember, I don't know, three years ago when you logged into Slack for the first time, there were these pulsing beacons that you could click on to get more help. And we decided that we were going to take that idea and make it so that a product manager or a product marketer could put those into their product without code. And so what we did is uh, we made a landing page for the feature. We started showing it to customers. They thought it was, they thought it was pretty cool. And uh, our engineering team started to work on it. We set a date for when we wanted to have it live. And then I went out and I pre-sold the feature. And so the goal was to get to, 30 customers by, uh, by like April 15th or something like that. And, you know, it's very much tied to this feature going live, which was, you know, I thought an excellent experience for our team at the time we were five, uh, because, you know, engineering got to really feel the win, uh, you know, because as soon as we hit a lot, we pushed that feature live. We already had the credit cards in the system ready to be charged. And so engineering really got to drive the, those sales. Um, in a meaningful way. And I, I think that was really a good early team goal because it was team wide. It wasn't just, you know, sales has this new revenue target. Um, you know, it was really felt by everyone in the, in the small organization at the time. So that was awesome. Uh, it's funny when I go into Stripe and I look at our account plans, there are actually still a couple customers on what's called the hotspot beta. And uh, I laugh at that and, and our ops team doesn't, doesn't really laugh at that. But, um, and then, uh, then about six months later, we sent our, our first revenue goal, which was like six, six K in MRR for a quarter. Uh, and, uh, and that was fun too. And that, that was kind of a, the revenue goals have always gone up since then. So, so your first revenue goal was six K in, in MRR? First revenue goal was six K MRR for a quarter. Um, and our packages at that time were, uh, 45 bucks, um, 199 bucks and 450 bucks. How did you come up with the pricing? The, that early pricing um, was, was just kind of internal debate. Um, you know, how much do we think people might pay for the product on the high end and, and what can we do to acquire customers uh, as easy as possible on the low end? Um, you know, we thought the low end at the time was, was really essential just because we needed people to talk to. We needed people to, to, you know, build in product experiences and see if that could improve their free trial conversion or, you know, increase retention for existing users. We needed those customer stories and we were really willing to, to go low on the pricing in order to get them. Um, I think there's definitely a counter argument that, you know, what you're doing there is you're learning how to acquire customers, which is important. Uh, but it doesn't necessarily, um, set you up to learn how to provide value to customers because what happened is, you know, we got really good at bringing on, new customers early on, but we never got really good at <laughs> making them successful. And so, uh, you know, it took us a while to invest in customer success. And, you know, because of that, we, we brought on and churned a ton of early customers um, and were able to exceed our sales goals pretty quickly, but, but weren't really ending up with the volume of customer stories that I think uh, you really want when you're bringing a new product to market. Yeah. Okay, and, and so what kind of changes did you make? Uh, how, how did you find out what changes needed to be made uh, in order to keep the clients happy and, and bring the value to them? 
twofold. One is, you know, there, there are typically table stakes, right? Like this is what we need a product to be able to do at a baseline for me to execute on, you know, whatever internal initiative I have. And so, you know, to start with, we had to make sure that our product could handle the table stakes for organizations that we wanted to work with. And that took a lot longer than we expected. We work with, we work inside of everyone else's products that in, in everyone writes their products differently. And a lot of products are, you know, the code isn't written very well and we need to be able to handle all of those edge cases without, you know, building something custom. And so everything that we built in the early days took longer than we expected to work across, uh, you know, the, the large majority of businesses we wanted to work with. And so solving for the table stakes was super important. Um, and, and we always kind of underestimated the amount of time that it would take to, to get to that point. The other one is, and I, I, I imagine this is, uh, this is unique to businesses that are bringing a new product to market. Um, and it's, it's not as relevant to a business, you know, business that might be building a, a new email tool because people already know how to do email. Um, most people that we've worked with, most product managers haven't owned where to put tool tips in in-app messages to prompt, you know, feature adoption inside of a product. Um, and that means, you know, they really look to you for help on what, what am I supposed to do with this product? And for a long time, you know, we really wanted to build this super low touch funnel, right? Like borderline freemium. And we didn't really give customers all of the, the help that they needed to, to try app queues, to iterate with it, to try it again. And ultimately, you know, we hired somebody for customer success. Um, and, you know, we ended up spending most of that customer success person's time on doing support tickets, right? And so we lived in this totally reactive world where people were just, you know, they had fires all the time. We were trying to put them out because of product incompatibilities. And we were never you know, getting in there with our customers and really trying to help them solve for value. We were just trying to, you know, reactively solve for getting the product to work. And, you know, it, it took a really long time for us to start doing proactive customer success. You know, I would say, you know, we've been in business for, for almost four years and um, our customer success team grew beyond one person this July. So it was a very, a very long cycle to invest in that. And like, it's immediately paid enormous dividends. Right? We get more at-bats on this problem than anyone else in the world. So obviously, people should come to us to get our help. Right? I, I think we needed to take our own expertise um, a little more seriously. Okay. Interesting. I want to I take a step back at something that you said before that you had a back to the monetary targets. You said that you kind of just pulled the, pulled the 6K MR quarterly out of thin air. But how did you actually price the the product itself? Uh, did you look at any competition uh, in order to get that, or were you kind of just looking at what your costs were and and basing it off of there? We definitely weren't looking at our costs. Um, our main consideration for pricing was, you know, we had talked to hundreds of people at that time, and you know, we had kind of tested their willingness to pay. Uh, later on, you know, in, in further iterations of our of our pricing, we've actually <clears throat> used this firm called Price Intelligently that are based in Boston that are, you know, who are fantastic at helping you solve for your pricing in a very scientific way. Um, they actually have one of my favorite marketing websites too. But, uh, you know, for us, it was like, what do we think these people will pay? And, you know, our pricing would change every six months or so. And I, I would just kind of throw numbers at people and, and see if, if they would pay. And then, you know, when they wouldn't, we'd, we'd lower it. Um, and when they would, I'd, you know, take a credit card. But, you know, I, I think the big thing for us was um, if there was ever misalignment on price, we would just discount, right? We, we wanted people to talk to. And that's what we really believed at the time was we needed as many people as possible using our product and giving us feedback, Um in order to grow. And that was, that was really our strategy. So, you know, if you wanted a discount and you were willing to use app cues, you were going to, you were going to get that discount. Okay. And is, uh, is that still kind of the methodology you use today? No. Um, as, as much as I, I like discounting, um, which I, I do really like discounting, especially when I was at, when I was at HubSpot. Um, you know, I think, I think it does cheapen the value of the product. I think even today, if you look at our pricing, you know, I think we, we could definitely, there's definitely room for us to charge more. 
And I think our pricing today is very fair uh, for any buyer, especially because we're going to, you know, at certain packages, we're going to give you a lot of customer success resources. Um, and we're not going to, you know, we're not going to charge services on them right now. So I, I think our pricing is extremely fair at the moment. And so um, we, we, we don't discount at this stage, but early on, we believed volume of customer customers was most important where today I want customers that are going to see value. I want customers whose organizations are aligned to getting value out of a tool like AppQs. Uh, and if, you know, our, our products like, you know, 12 grand a year for most companies, if, if improving your free trial conversion by 1% isn't worth 12 grand to you, uh, you know, I, we're never going to be aligned, but, but very few businesses <laughs> make that argument. And so I, I think today, um, we're, we don't need to do that to bring on customers. So let's, uh, let's take a step forward now. Uh, now you've kind of got your pricing uh, figured out. At what stage do you uh, choose to start increasing your sales team? So for us, basically, uh, we were 100% inbound from the start and we've always gotten a good amount of inbound leads almost entirely through content, right? We're from most, a lot of us are from HubSpot uh, and we saw content work really well there. And I think a lot of great businesses that you see today have excellent content strategies and vision is one that I love. Intercom is just, you know, fantastic. And, uh, we decided that we were going to try outbound. I had experimented with it myself. It was just right. Just me on the sales side of things and gotten solid traction, you know, and only doing it two hours a day for a month. And so we decided to hire two BDRs, one who would focus on our target market and one who would focus on, uh, the enterprise market, which we were very curious about. And the way we defined enterprise was actually people whose businesses started uh, before the year 2000. And our idea at the time there was those, those businesses buy differently. Um, they have bigger procurement processes. Uh, they, they are used to being sold to, not signing up for free products. And so we brought in two BDRs um, to start booking appointments for me as an AE. And then I was also doing all of the inbound and then essentially we got to this point where I was doing eight or nine demos a day, which was exhausting. And we looked at the conversion rate on, we were working outbound leads, right? We were working inbound free trial signups, and then we were working content leads. So people who signed up for an ebook on our website and the conversion rate on content leads was abysmal. The conversion rate on outbound was okay. Um, but the conversion rate on inbound was fantastic. And so what we decided to do, uh, or I, I started thinking about, I forgot where I heard it, but the, the concept of like, I felt like I was working in the business, not on the business, because I was doing so many demos. I was just, again, like in this reactive mode. Um, so we actually took the two BDRs, Ted and Jackie, and we moved them to AEs. And then I took a step back into a manager role. And we cut out outbound and we cut out the content leads and we focused exclusively on just our inbound free trial signups. Uh, and, and that was really where our sales team started to grow. And then that is where we've continued to hire is into that inbound account executive role. And then only uh, in 2018 did we bring on BDRs again. Okay. And uh, what, what did you do with the the signups for white papers and things like that, or outbound leads uh, that were already in the system? Are, did you kind of just let them frail out? Did you put them into like a marketing campaign? Marketing took ownership over content leads. Um, I, you know, I, I think even a lean organization like we are today, there's, there's definitely more we could do with, with taking our ebook downloads and, and some of our other content style leads uh, and, and improving their, their conversion to, you know, what we call like an MQL, just somebody you were, a trial or a demo. Um, and then, you know, the outbound leads, right. We just stopped, we just stopped working them. We didn't add new ones to the system. Uh, and we just totally moved on from that. Okay. You, you said something, uh, earlier that, you know, you were working in the business, not on the business. 
uh, at what stage did you finally wake up to that? And how did you make that transition? Because that's hard because the reason why you were in there is you were so busy. Why we did it was because ultimately, like, if you believe that your business is going to is going to grow and it's going to become a hundred million dollar revenue business, you know, at some point you need to grow a sales team. And at some point you need a sales leader to focus on uh, messaging, sales operations, working with marketing to drive higher quality leads. Uh, you need to figure out training and hiring for sales executives. And uh, we just got to the point to where one, we had the capacity of demos to support two people, right? Um, and and there were just a ton of things that needed to be worked on in the business. You know, our uh, you know webinars that we did for lower touch leads uh, needed work, and um, I was the person who was going to go work on those things. And you know, the the difficult challenge there was like we took two people who didn't have sales experience, and we let me who didn't have management experience teach them how to sell. Um, and so it was definitely a risky point, but we invested really heavily into training Ted and Jackie on the AE, uh, the AE position. I worked super closely with them. And fortunately I had just done this sale for a long time, right. And a lot of at bats. So I knew it very well and I could teach them how to do it. They picked it up quickly. Um, and you know, we just really invested a lot in training. And when you say you invested a lot in training, you mean your your time or did you get kind of outsource help? Uh, our time. So, you know, we would do we would do 30 minute check ins at the beginning and end of every day to cover you know everything that we did activities wise, um, go over any questions that came up during that day. And then we built out a, a pretty in-depth training program, starting with, you know, how do you rate a lead all the way to negotiating and closing and, and when to bring in a lawyer for negotiation, et cetera. Uh, and that's something we've continued to invest in as we've grown. How did you how did you choose to take them from BDR and into sales executives? Because it's a it's a different sales uh, skill set. So how did you know that they were ready for that challenge? How did I know they were ready for that challenge? Ted had been in sales for a couple of years. Very good communicator. I was confident that with a with us working together every single day, right? Was, now we're a sales organization of three. It's not like you're going to get lost uh, or get left alone if you're struggling. We're working really closely together. I, I, I knew that he had the innate skills uh, to do it already, and it was just about you know working together to to figure out you know where he had weaknesses he could overcome. Um, and and Jackie, on the other hand, was less than a year out of school at this time, and she's just incredibly diligent. And, and, you know, it, we had people who would buy our product who didn't necessarily need long conversations. And I was confident at the very least, even if it took her a long time to develop the, the conversational sales skills and the ability to qualify, um, every lead was going to hear from her a lot. And she was excellent at our, at our product. She was a, a major, we all took turns on support every day. And she was dominant on the support side of things. So she knew our product inside and out. She was confident that she could help people be effective with our product inside of a free trial. Um, and now that, that's a huge part of our sale, right? We're, we're product led. We sell inside of a free trial every single day. Um, and so you gotta be an expert in the product. And um, you know, Jackie's skills there made me confident that, you know, again, with, with a lot of attention to, to growing the, the soft sales skills, um, she would, at the very least, be really good at making at getting people the value that they were looking for out of our product. You, you said that you put them on. You, all of you guys took turns on on support. I think that's a very uh, unique way to get people to be familiar with your product, inside and out. Yeah, I mean, we we our engineers to this day rotate on support. Uh, we do weekly rotations now, um, but at that time, I I also ran support and. We, uh, we all took turns every day um, running support. There's, there's no better way to, to learn the product inside of a product that organization. There's no better way to feel the pain that your users are feeling. Um, so it's been, I think it's an essential part of our culture. And even, even when a new employee, sales rep, customer success person, marketer uh, joins the AppQs team, their second week at AppQs is spent entirely on support. Wow, it's a really uh, interesting approach. And it, and it's turned out to be very successful for you to do that. It has. It's it's high leverage. Yeah. Particularly on sales and customer success, 
Um, but, but marketing too, right? Like you want to understand the customer, you know, that could take months and months of, of hearing things passively, you know, through the engineering team, through, you know, like our, our UX feedback sessions, but instead we, we dump you in and, um, you know, by the end of that week, you should understand intimately, you know, what your, our users are trying to achieve and what are their roadblocks so that you can more effectively communicate to them, whatever kind of role you're in. Absolutely. All right. I, I want to take a step back at the beginning of the conversation uh, of this with the BDRs uh, while they were BDRs. Uh, you had them going after different uh, targets. So generally, people like to have, you know, at least two people working the same thing. So you could compare uh, the KPIs and, and see, you know, if it's if it's the salesperson or if it's just the wrong kind of target audience that you're going after. Uh, but you had only one. Was that a challenge for you? How did you how did you work with that? Was it a challenge to have a rep in an isolated role where you couldn't compare them to another person? Yes. So, yes and no. Uh, Ted, who was working our core business, the people we already knew were a good fit, booked appointments out of the gate with companies who were a good fit, and and we started to get sales. Right. So I would say that. Uh, that worked. So maybe if it didn't work, we would have been at a major loss because we wouldn't have learned whether or not outbound was going to work for our business because we didn't execute properly. Um, but on the other hand, you know, Jackie also did a good job of booking appointments with companies in the enterprise, right? But none of them bought. Yeah. We didn't close one of them. And so, you know, I, I think there are several variables there, you know, maybe Jackie, wasn't able to book appointments with the right people. Maybe I am just not good at selling to the enterprise and, and I was never going to close a great appointment. Um, I think our assumptions at the time were, you know, there were things that we were lacking. You know, we didn't have permissions or roles in our product. Um, we, you know, our, our, our security was limited. Uh, you had to use our standard terms and conditions to buy. You know, I, I wonder in hindsight, you know, were we ever going to close any of these businesses? Um, even if, uh, even, even if we were talking to the right person and I, and I had a, you know, I delivered a great sales experience. Um, but I mean, yeah, you could question it in hindsight, whether or not that we might have uh, made a mistake there by not having two people in the same role. But um, at the same time, it, it ultimately did work out for us. So it's, it's tough to look back and say, yeah. Okay. When, when you move them both to account executives, uh, what kind of KPIs were you monitoring for? Appointments and new business. Okay, and when it, when they're brand new, when you're a brand new uh, salesperson, let's say you're just off the training and you're just starting, uh, what kind of KPIs are you monitoring? Are you also just only looking for appointments and new business, or are you looking to see how many phone calls they're making, how many emails they're sending, how much how much work they're doing? You know, frankly, I don't really look at those things. Mm -hmm. um, I look at appointments. And if there's an issue with appointments, we'll backtrack it, right? See if we're working leads appropriately. But I've got a couple of really simple views in my CRM that just show me if the lead goes unworked. When the lead, when a lead's not being worked that it should, I, I, I ping the rep and I say, hey, you should work this lead. And they typically get the message. They're like, oh, like, oh, I should pay attention to that. Maybe I missed this one for some reason. Um, but we look at we look at appointments. Um, and at the time we looked at new business, and when there was a gap an appointment to close uh you know we, we dug further into it and there were several occasions where there were gaps and there ended up being reasons for those gaps and we had to shift our strategy a little bit or, or coach on certain points in order to um close the gaps but you know we did a lot of call listening at the beginning i, I you know again right three people at the time i could listen to almost every phone call uh and, and that's how you learn really fast uh is, is you deal with reality you deal with the phone calls it's all qualitative at that point uh, I think it's really hard to, to over drill into the numbers unless, unless they look way, way off. Yeah. Okay. You said you that you, you could or you did listen to uh, all the phone calls. Uh, were you recording it or would you just sit, sit in uh, on the calls? A little bit of both. Uh, take a step back. Uh, you said earlier that you guys are offering kind of a free trial. Uh, are there challenges that you face with, with doing this, uh, with allowing clients to have free reign of your product? Oh yeah. It's, it's totally different. When I was at HubSpot, you know, anytime somebody asked us for a free trial, 
so we're just selling the marketing software at the time when I was at HubSpot. The sales software wasn't robust yet. Uh, and we just say, no way. <laughs> you can't go into a trial. You'll never figure this out. You need a customer success person to be successful with this product. Um, you're going to get nothing out of a free trial. Don't do it. And they just wouldn't, you know, because um, it is a huge piece of software. There's 27 apps in it. Um, it's overwhelming. Like, uh, and so at AppQs, right, like our first engagement, like people get everything. They get to do everything with the trial. It is not watered down at all. And so the challenge is, is like, why does somebody want to talk to you? Right? They're here to use software. You're giving them the software. What's why talk to a salesperson? Right? And and so a salesperson needs to be value add. Um, they're not a gatekeeper. They're not blocking somebody from getting what they want. They're 100 percent value add. And so your prospecting approach approach needs to be different. Um, your sales process needs to be different. Um, and it's not drastically different when you think about the fundamentals of sale of sales of, you know, qualifying somebody, uh, understanding if they're a good fit, trying to tell a relevant story to them so they can understand how you know they could envision using your product, uh, making a purchasing decision like that's all in there. Um, but the context is different. Um, and I really like it. I think that's, I think that's where sales is going. Um, right. That's a part of why I'm at AppQs is because we help businesses in a free trial. Uh, I believe that, you know, the, with, with so many different SaaS products, um, there's a ton of competition and with increased competition, a lot of times the barrier to entry gets lowered. And that means that you need to deliver a great product experience because you've lowered your barrier to entry. Design becomes more important. You know, look at a company again, like Envision and Intercom, which just absolutely you know, crush design and their businesses are incredibly successful. Um, and so I think that's where the market's going. That's why I wanted to learn how to sell within a free trial business. That's why I care about being at AppQs and, and our mission. Um, but it's, it's, it's very different and um, I'm pretty pumped to get to be a part of it. We, we think about it as product led. It's the terminology we use. We do product, product led. We lead with our product. Okay. And so have you always been a free trial from, from the start or, or once you actually had a product, I guess? From the very beginning. Yeah. Yeah. And so what are some of your, do you have any key customers uh, from the early days that kind of really helped change the path of Accus? Totally. Um, number one is this person, Peter Clark. Peter Clark was at AdWell at the time. He's now at uh, Jewel the uh like the e-cigarette company um and peter was their head of growth and basically they had decided as an organization that they were going to build internally um a product that would allow uh peter's growth team to launch messages into their own product without going through engineering and he stumbled upon our product and in a lot of ways saw where we were going better than we did at the time. And he signed up for our product and I started working with him and, you know, he installed us and like, he started doing very real things with our tool and our tool broke on it really bad. <laughs> you know, we show messages inside of your product. We are, we are affecting your, you know, your core experience for a lot of businesses. And this is 2015, right? And we had this bug where we were showing every message twice to users. And like, I, I, I had a heart attack, you know, I, I felt so guilty about bringing somebody onto this platform that, that just kind of crapped the bed on them. And, you know, he kind of stuck with us and uh, I was like, no, I get it. Uh, and he stuck around, we fixed the bug. You know, we, we had to do a lot more testing to make him comfortable with staying live with us. Um, but over the years, you know, he was our first case study. Um, when we've released, you know, updates to our product, a lot of them started with conversations that we would have with Peter. And uh, what you need as an early stage business is you need to find uh, kind of back to like, we wanted to find a lot of customers who would use our product to get feedback from them. Like if I was starting a business today, that's absolutely not what I would do. Um, you know, I would find a few customers that are in your target market that believe in the vision that you believe in and find a way to deliver them an enormous amount of value. doesn't matter if it's in a scalable way or if it's in a product way, do whatever you have to do to get them a ton of value. 
uh, and then later on figure out how you can scale that you know that delivery of the value to a ton of other businesses. But Peter, you know, had the same vision as us. He wanted to deliver an incredible product experience without having to go, you know, without having salespeople to have to call folks, uh, without having to bombard people with email, right? And um, he started using our product in ways that that we never really thought of. Uh, you know, personalizing his own product experience using app cues. And, you know, they were getting really, really great results. You know, previously they had, you know, we're in 2015 here, but like previously they had, uh, you know, when they'd done a product release and they wanted to get users to adopt their new products, they were getting three to 5% uh, opens on the emails that they would send out to people. And then 1% of pe- those people were going into the product and actually uh, trying it out, right? It's a miserable conversion rate. And with AppQs, right, everybody who logged into the product, right, who saw a message telling them to try a new feature, we had 20% of people actually trying the feature. Um, you know, that's not rocket science, right? Like people get too many, people get too much email. I think everybody could agree with that. Um, and people spend time in the product when they're thinking about you. So it is kind of one-to-one. Um, but Peter like did that all on his own. He figured all that on his own. He brought the data to us on his own. Um, and you know, without him, I, I, I really wonder where we would be, be as a business. Yeah. Need to offer him stock options. Uh, I, 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 I don't know, but I think he actually might have them. I think he's an official advisor to us at this stage. Oh, nice. Okay, great. So now you're, We've been talking about very early stages, and now we're you're at a team of nine. Uh, what have been some of your biggest challenges in, in growing your sales team uh, to that larger size? You know, the the fundamental challenge that uh, we're dealing with today is we've been one hundred percent inbound, and now we need to get out back on. Mm-hmm. And our market is software businesses, right? It's it's not you know at HubSpot our market was. Every SMB in America, there's 7 million of them. You know, how many, how many software businesses are there? All right, I'd say there's 10,000. How many of those software businesses, you know, fit our ideal customer profile and can pay us, you know, 12 grand a year? I don't know, like 3,000 of them, maybe? So we throw two BDRs at 3,000 companies, right? Like <laughs> we could burn through them in four months easily. Uh, and, and so figuring out exactly how to, how to be more, you know, how, to, how to not do that, but still book a meaningful volume of appointments is is what we're really trying to figure out today. Um, we've got some good early moment, momentum, but um, you know, understanding how that that team is going to grow uh, and continue to produce um, you know meaningful revenue is, is is the top challenge that that we're focused on uh, today. You you mentioned a lot about who your target uh, client is. How did you come to the that conclusion of who your target audience? It's evolved over time. Uh, you know, initially we thought it was product marketers at B2B software companies. Uh, and then we, I started messaging all the product marketers that I could find on the internet. And and it turns out that like one, a lot of times product marketers actually roll up to marketing, which means they're super removed from having the engineering resources required to get our product installed. And guess who very rarely has budget product marketers. Um, and, and we realized that we needed to get to the product team and it ended up being that product managers had the most, uh, the most leverage, uh, to get a tool like AppQs installed and purchased because they control engineering resources. They also feel the pain of, um, you know, their engineers having a million things to do and, you know, the product orgs tend to have budget. And so the market pulled us in that direction. We just, the people who bought ended up being product managers and product marketers didn't buy. So that that was it for a long time. We were focused on B2B. All the content we wrote was about B2B. And then uh, in 2016, we just started to have like B2C customers buy on their own, right? I mean, they would work with sales, but they came to us on their own. Um, And they started solving problems with our product uh, in a different way than we had before. And, you know, you know, if you start with two or three of them and like, oh, wow, like last quarter, like eight B2B customers bought and we charge based on user volume and they pay a lot more money. Um, and so, you know, that seemed like an obvious 
a good thing to us. And so, you know, our, our product team started interviewing a lot more of those customers and we were trying to figure out what to build and, and how to design our platform. Um, and so again, right, like we were kind of pulled in that direction. Uh, and then, you know, to where we are today, getting even more specific about it, saying it's B2B free trial and B2C, uh, you know, that came a lot from, you know, looking at the churn rates of our customer base. You, know, you got to do a cohort analysis, like where, where is the revenue coming from? That's good revenue. Uh, Cause it, it's, it's, yeah, it's solid revenue. Yeah. It's like, it's easy to feel good about new revenue, but when you start, you know, looking at, okay, what's my three month and six months retention on revenue. And you look at it, uh, you know, by a uh, company size, B2B versus B2C, uh, what the ACV is of all these different businesses. Uh, you, what, what other third party technology are they using, right? Like you could use a tool like Clearbit to just get a dump of like a million factors, but each of these businesses, and then you can look at like, all right, like what makes, you know, what makes a good customer? Um, and, you know, hopefully find some trends in there and, and they can inform what you want to do. Uh, but you couldn't, you can't do that early on because you don't have the volume to, to even like consider it to be statistically significant. So you got to go a lot with your gut. Um, and, and you got to have somebody on your team who you really trust to make those calls for us. It's, it's our bet. It's been our CEO, Jonathan Kim from the beginning. You know, we, we've relied on his instinct, um, a great amount. Great. Okay. Well, uh, John, I, it's been a great pleasure having you, uh, on with us and I'm sure, uh, some of our listeners here will would love to get in contact with you. What's the best way for somebody to reach out with you? LinkedIn's fantastic. Uh, John Shear, J O H N S H E R E R. Uh, you can find me on LinkedIn. Shoot me a note. Thanks for listening to Startup Sales with Adam Springer. Subscribe to the podcast so you never miss an episode. To contact Adam about consulting services or speaking engagements, visit StartupSalesPodcast.com or email StartupSalesPodcast at gmail.com. Good. So, John, just a few last questions here. Uh, what is your favorite sales or leadership book? Sales Acceleration Formula by Mark Roberge. Uh, I, I think Mark Roberge is the man in that book. That book uh, has informed a lot of decisions I've made. Yeah. Okay, great. Do you, uh, do you have someone that you follow or read for sales or leadership ideas? I love the Sasser blog. So Lemkin. Are you available 24 seven or do you have some strict personal time boundaries? I'm, I'm looking at my phone a lot. <laughs> Aren't we all even, yeah. even without work? Yes. <laughs> yeah. You know, it's, I can do, I can do most of my job on, on email, phone calls and Slack. Uh, so, so I'm, I'm pretty available. All right. What's your favorite tool that you use for sales? Favorite sales tool? Uh, the most essential sales tools for me is this tool called Hull.io. It's actually a data tool that connects a lot of our um, our databases, but it really allows for like great data cleanliness for us. And it also, we use the HubSpot CRM, um, which has limitations, and it really helps us overcome a lot of our limitations. Mm -hmm. Hull, like H-O-L-E? H-U-L-L. H-U-L-L dot I-O. Okay. I thought you were going to say Slack after uh, pushing Slack at the, at the question before. Well, we actually, <laughs> we actually use Hull to power messages through Slack to our sales reps. So when one of our leads does something cool in the trial, like maybe they invite a teammate, that actually hits, sets a notification in Hull, which then messages the rep via Slack. So Hull really is like a powerhouse. Interesting. Then I'll take a look at it. Lastly, uh, what one piece of advice do you have for all the founders, CEOs, and sales management out there? Uh, solve, for, solve for customer value, not customer volume. Great. John, thank you very much. It's been a pleasure. Uh, I think we got a lot of value from this. So uh, thanks for the time. Adam, I appreciate you having me. Thank you.